In the three or four weeks since making my last film on the subject, there has been a growing recognition of the longer-term effects of COVID-19 and the prevalence of those debilitating symptoms. What proportion of people are affected? How bad is it? And what can we do about it? Let's discuss. There's now no shortage of major news organisations reporting on the subject, although sometimes there's a lack of clarity in distinguishing between ongoing viral symptoms and post-viral fatigue, although this may be due in part to the peculiar nature of the way this virus presents itself. Here's the BBC. Then I had two weeks where I thought I was getting better, I was just very tired. And then on week seven I relapsed again and had my third wave, luckily much milder but still significant. It's lingering on. Here's the New York Times. The World Health Organization has stated that people with mild cases can expect recovery to take two weeks, while those with severe cases may take up to six weeks to recover. But the distinction between mild and severe cases is confusing, and many of us are experiencing symptoms for longer. The FT does distinguish between ongoing symptoms and post-viral fatigue. The persistence of tiredness has prompted some to speculate that this could be something like post-viral fatigue rather than COVID-19 itself. And then other articles address post-viral fatigue directly. Now, the Telegraph may have experienced some erosion of journalistic integrity, uh, competence, however you like to say it, the last few years, but this particular article is excellent. Based on my experience with SARS, I am deeply concerned that our definition of recovered is far too narrow. It is likely that some patients will experience chronic fatigue syndromes for months or even years after an initial infection, Dr. Moldovsky told The Telegraph. And indeed, there was a study done after SARS that showed a disconcerting proportion of people still experiencing symptoms a year after the initial infection. 87% reporting symptoms in this sample of 107 patients from Toronto. This article in The Guardian and a corresponding blog post in the BMJ by Professor Paul Garner are also particularly good. Some extracts. There is growing evidence that the virus causes a far greater array of symptoms than was previously understood, and that its effects can be agonisingly prolonged, in Garner's case for more than seven weeks. The professor at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine says his experience of COVID-19 featured a new and disturbing symptom every day, akin to an advent calendar. He had a muggy head, upset stomach, tinnitus, pins and needles, breathlessness, dizziness and arthritis in the hands. Each time Garner thought he was getting better, the illness roared back. It was a sort of virus snakes and ladders. It's deeply frustrating. A lot of people start doubting themselves, he says. Their partners wonder if there is something psychologically wrong with them. Since his piece was published, Garner has received emails and tearful phone calls from grateful readers who thought they were going mad. I'm a public health person, he says. The virus is certainly causing lots of immunological changes in the body, lots of strange pathology that we don't yet understand. This is a novel disease, and an outrageous one. The textbooks haven't been written. So there's no shortage now of acknowledgement for COVID-19's long, long tail. But how prevalent is it? For every Matt Hancock going back to stand on the podium six days after reporting symptoms, how many of us out there are still suffering? Well, that same Guardian article quotes Tim Spector from King's College London, whose team developed the COVID symptom tracker app. He estimates that about 200,000 of the 3 to 4 million Brits and Americans using the app are reporting symptoms which have lasted for the duration of a study, at the time of reporting, six weeks. That's one in 20. Clearly, there's a lot of people out there who are experiencing symptoms and not reporting them on the app. I'm sure many of you watching this film are amongst them. So however you look at these numbers, it really is a huge amount. Without question, this is a real thing. What's causing it? Well, we still don't really know. The scientists at the forefront of COVID-19 research are a little bit too cautious to start throwing explanations around, but there is this excellent article on the ME Association's website that also makes the uh, connection that I did in my last film about the link between cytokines uh, and the cytokine surge created by viral infection and post-viral fatigue. There is a slightly blurry line between post-viral fatigue syndrome and ME, uh, even in some of the studies out there where the two uh, conditions are sort of separated by a slash and that's it. And it doesn't help that both of those conditions are also used interchangeably with chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS. Where I think most people make the distinction between PVFS and ME is that one is a temporary virally instigated condition and the other is chronic and debilitating long term and may or may not ultimately resolve. 
I raised this issue as there was quite a lot of debate that came out of my last film about the possible progression from post-viral fatigue to ME. Whilst there are various ME forums and clinical groups that talk about this, as far as I'm concerned, there are a few outstanding questions. Firstly, are there any reputable studies that shows this actually happens? Secondly, if a viral infection leads to a case of ME, is there ever an intermediate stage of post-viral fatigue? Or if you're going to get ME, do you simply go straight there after the viral infection? And that kind of leads me through to my next question, connected to that, which is, is it possible that mistreatment of post-viral fatigue could ever lead to a case of ME? And, as an addendum to that, would that mistreatment consist of excessive exercise? Because this is the theory that is put forward by a lot of those proponents of this progression. So, how much empiric evidence is there for any of these questions? Well, the Open Medicine Foundation is an ME-focused organisation. Here they quote, 11% of patients experiencing severe infections from these viruses will go on to develop ME-CFS. But in an ideal world, we'd have a link to some peer-reviewed studies, rather than expressions like, it is thought, even if that thinking is done by doctors rather than generic internet crackpots. So, where does all of this leave us when it comes to treatment? Okay, so let's take it as read that you need to try and do your best to try and sleep well, eat well, and stay hydrated. But where does that leave us with the, the big issue, which is activity or exercise? In my last video, I spoke about personally having found mild to moderate exercise having been okay, particularly in my previous experience of post-viral fatigue, which was after glandular fever. However, what's mild or moderate for me on any one given day won't necessarily be the same degree of mild or moderate on the next given day or the day after that. And it certainly won't be the same for anybody else also experiencing post-viral fatigue at any given time. And what makes judging these levels of exercise even harder is that whilst you're doing them, they might feel completely okay. It's only later that you maybe realise that it wasn't, and the consequences of that can be quite serious. Here's an extract from Professor Paul Garner's blog in the BMJ, talking about a point in time seven weeks into his illness. I thought, soon I'll be back to my proper daily workout routines. I could exercise myself out of this state of lethargy. I was so wrong. After 12 hours, I was completely flawed. I was more exhausted than ever and could not get out of bed for three days. The sweats came back, the tinnitus, the foggy head, the headaches. I'm sick of you high-performing medics, a friend and specialist in rehabilitation said to me. Don't expect to be able to do what you did before. I listened. After being confined to the house for seven days, I went for my first gentle walk. It was effortless and the sun was shining. I extended it a little further than I had intended, a total of two miles. What a mistake. The next day, the COVID-19 fatigue was back with a vengeance, and I was in bed for two days. Any of us with post-viral fatigue can identify with this experience. We may not have overdone it to quite the same degree that Paul Garner did, but all of us will have experienced some form of this post-exertional malaise, or PEM. In fact, PEM was discussed at length in this August 2019 paper by the US ME and CFS Clinician Coalition, usefully posted in the comments actually on my last film. Patients experiencing PEM will often describe a crash, relapse or collapse after even small amounts of mental or physical exertion that was previously tolerated. During the crash, which may be immediate but more often delayed by hours or days, patients can experience an exacerbation of one or all of their symptoms and a further reduction in functioning. It can take hours, days, a week or even longer to return to their previous baseline after a crash. Some patients may go through cycles of overexerting and crashing, while others may have learned to reduce or change activities to minimise crashes. For some patients, even basic activities of daily living can result in PEM. Now, we don't know for sure what the longer-term consequences of post-exertional malaise are. Could one too many bouts of PEM lead to a chronic ME-type illness that doesn't resolve? Some people out there think so. I searched, but I couldn't find the BMJ study referred to here, or indeed any other one that looked legit that Joan McParland here refers to. The closest we've got is the debunked PACE trial from 2011, which led to surveys by the ME Association finding that half of patients who'd followed the recommended graded exercise program had seen a worsening of symptoms. So we don't know. But is it possible that COVID-19 triggered post-viral fatigue could in some cases lead to an ME-type chronic illness that doesn't resolve quickly? 
Well, we've seen enough other strange stuff going on with this virus that I certainly wouldn't want to rule it out. And what does this mean for those of us who are still suffering with energy levels fatigue, headaches, <laughs> general malaise and everything else weeks or months after that initial infection? Certainly nothing that triggers any kind of post-exertional malaise. And you can kind of forget about any kind of activity level that you're used to or you might expect from yourself. Anything that you used to do pre-COVID is now more or less irrelevant. Before COVID, I was in the final stages of training for the London Marathon and I was clocking up to about 90 kilometers a week. And in fact, the day before I experienced my first symptom, I went for a hard 17 kilometer marathon race pace run. So that was 17K at four minutes and two seconds a kilometer. Now the gentle jogs I was going on were two to three kilometers at about eight minutes a kilometer. So that is quite literally an eighth of the distance at half of the pace. And for reference, eight minute kilometers are about 13 minute miles. So that's barely faster than walking pace. Now, this obviously isn't a, a level of exercise that's anything close to what my body was previously used to, but was it still enough to stop me from getting better? Well, I don't know, but I have felt the fatigue lifting since I stopped going for these gentle jogs. What has become slightly clearer to me as I struggle through this bout of post-viral fatigue is that I appear to have some kind of energy budget which I have to spend judiciously throughout the day. That is to say a certain finite amount of energy with which I have to achieve all of my daily activities and any exercise I choose to do. I would estimate that in the two months I've been suffering from this post-viral fatigue that that energy budget has increased from perhaps 10% of its normal pre-COVID level to about 20% now on a good day. So I can go for a short, easy jog, but I'd better have a quiet day afterwards because the chances are I've already spent a good proportion of my budget. Sleeping is good. Uh, if I'm lucky enough to have a rare good night's sleep, then I'm going to get as much budget as I could possibly get for the next day. And napping is also good. That does seem to reload the amount of energy you have left for the rest of the day. So like this ME association recommendation, activity should be gentle within your limitations. This is not inconsistent with what I was talking about in my last film. My exercise recommendation there of mild to moderate was certainly only for activity within your budget. I think my clarification here would be that if you make the choice to go for moderate rather than mild, be aware this will have consequences in terms of the choices you should be making for how you spend the rest of your day. So in conclusion on this subject, I think it's probably safe to say don't try and exercise yourself better. I think it's probably a lot safer to try and rest yourself better. Within reason, of course, don't turn into one of Kevin Spacey's set pieces from the 1995 film Seven. Here's an excellent online leaflet from the ME Association talking about COVID-19 and post-viral fatigue. I'll provide the link in the description. It does a much better job of summing up the condition and giving advice about how to manage it than I can in this video. From activity management or pacing to mental well-being, sleep and nutrition, all of their advice is worth following. As I record this, it's now the 23rd of May. We may be a few weeks further into the pandemic, but we're still in the very early stages of trying to understand the SARS-CoV-2 virus and its effects on the human body. We don't know how long it'll take the 200,000 of us still experiencing symptoms to start to feel better, but at least we do know that we're not alone, uh, we're not going mad, and there's growing recognition of the condition. So stay sane, look after yourselves, and if you've got any advice or recommendations or experiences you want to share, uh, let's continue the discussion in the comments. Till next time. <laughs>